so excited to introduce our speaker for tonight, someone that I've looked up to and followed their work for quite some time. Um, Dr. Daphne Miller will be talking with us the, this evening and we'll be talking about growing health from the soil up, the links between earth, farms, food, and well-being. What an important, timely topic with all the conversation and the urgency around climate change and the things that have been going on. Um, we're so excited to have you join us, Dr. Miller. I'm gonna briefly read Dr. Miller's bio so that we can all be familiar with the wonderful work that she's doing. And then I'll be turning over um, the microphone, so to speak, to Dr. Miller to, to share with us. Dr. Miller is a practicing family physician and curriculum director for the Integrative and Community Medicine Program at Lifelong Family Medicine Residency Program in Richmond, California. She is Lifelong's representative to Richmond Rising, a partnership of community nonprofits working together to advance health equity, food security, and climate resilience. She also leads Health from the Soil Up at University of California Berkeley School of Public Health, a program to engage health professionals in food system transformation. She is a regular health and science contributor to the Washington Post and has published two books about food, agricultural, and health. The Jungle Effect, The Science and Wisdom of Traditional Diets, and Pharmacology, Total Health from the Ground Up. Dr. Miller is a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Miller completed her residency in a primary care fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and additional fellowships at the Berkeley Food Institute and the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We're so excited to hear from you. Please share with us what you have for us this evening. Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you for that introduction. And I'm very grateful to Osher for this invitation. I am so delighted to be here to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, first of all, I think it's really important when talking about food and farming to say that I have nothing to disclose here in terms of relevant financial relationships. I spend most of my week, as uh, Dr. Matthews uh, explained, in a clinic in North Richmond. You can see it there on the map, um, and it's the William Jenkins Health Center. But uh, despite my day job, I have to tell you that my mind is often deep in the soil. As uh, some of my friends like to say, um, I'm uh, often entertaining dirty thoughts. Um, but uh, why soil? Why is this something that has intrigued me for so long? Um, so as a doctor, I really do think of this as sort of a, a root of our health, a, a, a foundation for healing. And if you think about it, um, if you take Earth's habitable land and look at it, about 98% about of it is actually in some way or another connected to soil. It's either in agriculture, in forests, or in shrubs, shrubland. Only about 2% of habitable earth is actually concrete in cities. So much of where we exist is actually rooted in soil. And just for this simple fact alone, this substrate has so much to do with our well being. Um, but we're at a point where we really are in kind of a soil crisis, if I, if I might say. Um, and um, I talk a lot about major soil health threats when I'm um, having conversations or speaking to folks who work in agriculture or earth sciences. But tonight is a health talk. And the interesting thing is when I talk to folks in healthcare, I talk about the exact same things. I just take out the word soil because these are actually the same things that are major health threats for us. And um, I, I, at the risk of oversimplifying, um, I, I see these three th uh, threats as consolidation, disturbance, and waste. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about these three things before we move on to happier ideas of, uh, you know, about how we can actually harness the healing effects of soil. So what do I mean by these three major health threats and three major uh, soil health threats? 
if you first take the idea of consolidation, um, this is actually a map which shows regions of this country and what is being grown there. And if you see much on this map is either green, red, or yellow, or you know, sort of orangey yellow. And what that is actually showing is um, uh, the three major crops that we have going on, which are corn, soy, and then to slightly less of a degree, wheat. And the whole middle part of our country is taken up with basically the, these three crops. There are vegetable crops going on and exceptions, but when you look at the preponderance of what is being put in the soil there, it is these three crops. And why is that problematic? Well, when uh, if you think about it, and this is another way of looking at that same graph, that we, in fact, since the 1960s to now, we've um, increased by over 15 million acres, um, the amount of maize or corn and soybeans that we're growing. Well, it's kind of the same problem as if, you know, you as a human were just eating one food. Uh, what it is, is actually not giving the soil the substrate that it needs or the microbes that it needs in order to be healthy. And so the same consolidation is actually happening with land ownership. So it's not just what we're growing, it's who owns the land. And in the same time from the 60s to the 80s, what you had uh, was um, a lot of consolidation. There was um, uh, antitrust laws that were done away with in the Reagan era. And um, what happened was that big landowners started to buy up uh, smaller farms. And so the number of farms that are over 2,000 acres actually doubled between the 1980s and 2012. And at the same time, the farms in the middle, which were the ones that were around 1,000 to 500 acres, which were also the ones that were growing a diversity of crops, they started to shrink and go away and be bought up by these larger landowners. And these large landowners are the ones who were growing the corn, soy, and the wheat in much more of an industrial scale. The same consolidation is not just happening with what we're growing and who owns that land, it's happening with the seeds that we're putting on their land and on that land. So in the 60s, we had hundreds, if not thousands, of small mom and pop seed companies that were growing, uh, were growing and selling hybrid seeds for you know, different kinds of cucumbers and squash and tomatoes that did well in your region and in your climate. And what happened with the same corporate consolidation is five or six big companies really bought up most of those mom and pop seed companies. And actually in most instances actually put a lot of those small uh, varietals on the top shelf and stopped selling them and started selling much more of these F1 seeds that are you know just one specific uh, genetic type of tomato or carrot or certainly of corn and have what have you. And if you look at the names of these companies, what you're surprising is um, that actually a lot of them are not just agricultural seed companies, like uh, they're also pharmaceutical companies. And that's uh, like such as Syngenta and Bayer and so on. And this works quite wonderfully for them because in fact, what they are are chemical companies <laughs> and the same products you know, that they're rolling out for humans, they're actually using in various ways in agriculture as well. So you have this consolidation in what we're growing, the seeds we're using and who's owning the land. And at the end of the day, uh, this is what's going on. We have 90 million acres a year planted just in corn. Uh, that is, uh, you know, it's just uh, impossible to conceive of in terms of the sheer volume of it. And um, you end up getting the same way, as I said, as if you're eating only one thing, we get soil that is degraded, that uh, is losing its substrate and losing uh, the microbes because it really is just growing one thing. I cannot prove causation here, but there's incredibly powerful correlation in the, that same time frame that we've seen where all this consolidation is going on. We've also seen an explosion in diet-related diseases, including type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And um, one must wonder if the same consolidation has had that impact as well with what has changed in our food system. So 
The next issue is disturbance. And I know it is rather strange that with that negative term, as I'm portraying it here, I have something that we all associate with such healthful eating and positivity, which is almonds. Um, but in fact, the way we grow almonds can be quite problematic. And here in California, we have one and a half million acres of almonds. And most of those ac that acreage is in the Central Valley. You can see it all right there. And so and once again, in a heat map, all the areas that are yellow and green. And um, this is the most fragile part of California with the most fragile soil. And we have an enormous monocrop of almonds going on there. And what's happening on the ground is because this is an industrial production of almonds, we strip the ground bare so that you know, we're not dealing with pests. And when it becomes time to harvest season, it's easier to harvest the almonds um, you know, just on the ground. What happens is they come through and shake them and harvest them on the ground. But because we've gotten rid of all of the understory, all the things that grow among these trees. And because there only are almond trees where they're free to sort of spread their diseases amongst each other, what we have is this terrible problem of fungal blights or fungus infection on these trees. So what they have to come through and do, and you know, the if the if the if the weeds were growing underneath these trees, what they would do in the rainy seasons, like what we just had, is they would be sucking that water up and keeping it from um, uh, causing so much dampness that fungal infections would happen. And if you had stuff growing out under the trees in the hot season, what it would actually do is hold the water in and maintain the moisture. But because we don't have that under the trees, what we have to go do is go through and spray these trees with fungicides, which further degrades the bacteria in the soil and the, and the microbes in the soil. Um, it also unfortunately can impact the bees that are imported to fertilize <laughs> these trees. And so we have this unvirtuous cycle going on. And we end up oftentimes with tree death, you know, acres of tree death. And sometimes these trees just senesce out or die out on their own. But then you can imagine once you have to pull up acres of these trees, you're left with bare soil with nothing else growing on it that is very vulnerable to be a wash away and to degrade. And that's why we're seeing such serious problems with soil loss and land loss in the Central Valley, which is this important um, center of food production. And this is all because we really are doing monocropping of almonds, something which is actually quite healthy at the end of the day, is, is almonds are at least healthy for us. Um, the other thing we're doing a lot of in, uh, in this country is plowing. And what could be more American than plowing? I mean, it's like you think of that as the thing you do in spring. But we're now discovering that, in fact, plowing and chopping up the topsoil, it sends, it, it basically, rotor, you know, turns it, blenderizes it, I think is probably the best term, and destroys these fragile networks of mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria that live in the soil and that keep it healthy. It aerosolizes the soil. And we then have all these public health issues in the Central Valley um, as a result of this, with some of the highest rates of asthma and other and valley fever and things like that. So, you know, these problems uh, very much relate to us in, in many ways. Um, the third problem is waste. And once again, I'm showing another beautiful food, carrots, but this is a photograph that I took a couple of years ago in the Central Valley near Hollister. In the, I took this in August in a year where they had only had seven inches of rain in the whole year. And what you see in this photo is that they are overwatering these this monocrop of organic carrots, I should add, to the point where the tops are turning yellow. For any of you who are gardeners, you know that's not a good sign when things are turning yellow, uh, when they're supposed to be a deep green. And we're seeing that the water is washing away. So we're actually wasting this precious water. Where is it washing? It's washing towards Los Angeles. Um, and it's bringing all these important vital nutrients from the soil with it. 
So uh, despite the fact that this is a really healthy crop of carrots, you know, um, you know, or a, a crop of carrots that's healthy for us, it's a very unhealthy way of growing it. And uh, what we're seeing here is that we're using more and more nitrogen-based fertilizer um, since the 1960s in order to get the same volume of produce. So we're going to diminishing returns with our soil where we're having to put a lot more fertilizer in. And this is not just synthetic fertilizer. This is also what we would call organic fertilizer like manure um, is probably just as problematic. And um, especially so because nitrous oxide, uh, which is the greenhouse gas byproduct of nitrogen fertilizer is a very potent greenhouse gas. I think, you know, maybe 300 times more potent than CO2 and something that we should be really concerned about. And this is a child's uh, diagram from an article for Kids in Frontiers magazine. But what you're seeing here is this idea of what is called eutrophication, where the nitrogen that we're trying to use to fertilize our plants is actually getting into the waterway, where it's making water undrinkable and uh, creating uh, fungal problems in, in, in ponds and so on. And, um, and you see the arrows going up, um, contributing to, to climate change. And so this uh, waste of fertilizer is another enormous issue. This was an image from the height of COVID where we were not even able to get into the fields and harvest, but waste of food is, is, an, is another uh, very, very real thing even now where so many imperfect bits of produce never make it out of the field. This headline also from the height of COVID, I think just captures how all these different problems converge from heat, smoke and COVID to batter the farm workers who are really the ones who are most proximal uh, to these problems, even though they, they affect all of us. Now that I framed the issues or the problems at hand of um, um, in, in, in terms of the idea of consolidation and uh, disturbance and waste. What are the solutions to this, both to improve the health of our soil, but also to improve our health and well being? Well, it's the three opposite ideas it's boosting biodiversity as opposed to consolidation, it's minimizing disturbance, and it's conserving resources. And I really would like to propose that these are should be sort of like the three pillars of um, personal health as well. And so let me explain this a little bit. So in terms of boosting diversity, I think it's uh, important, first of all, to talk about uh, the kinds of agriculture uh, that are out there that are doing that. There's a lot of different terms that are currently being used for this. One that you might be familiar with is regenerative agriculture. Um, another one is agroecological approaches to agriculture or restorative agriculture is another term that's used. Um, personally, I am not so wedded to the term. I'm wedded to the concepts that the terms um, uh, uh, espouse. And so that's what I'm talking about right now. And what I think is actually really important for us to all understand is that all of these terms are inspired by practices that are really indigenous practices for taking care of the land. The three things that I mentioned, boosting biodiversity and minimizing disturbances and conserving resources are the way that uh, folks from around the globe who have been able to maintain healthy soil for thousands and thousands of years have treated their land and practiced as communities. So those really are the practices that I'm going to, to uh, um, underscore right now. So boosting diversity as the first idea. When I talk about diversity, I'm talking about diversity in the soil, but I'm also talking about diversity of seed. You know, as we saw, the, the loss of uh, diversity in seeds has been a real issue. I'm talking about diversity of plants. And finally, I'm talking about diversity in the people who own the land and grow the food as well. And what we found is that diversity on all these layers is actually really, really important if you wanna have a healthy system. 
So starting in the soil, why does diversity in the soil matter? Well, you need a lot of different soil microorganisms and macroorganisms such as voles and, and uh, different kinds of reptiles and so on um, in order to have healthy soil and healthy plants. All of these different well, workers underground have incredibly important roles above ground um, in terms of how they're scavenging uh, nutrients, uh, how they're moving those nutrients to the rootlets of the plants, how they're decomposing matter, how they're actually communicating each with each other with different kinds of chemical signaling and so on. And so all these different players are really, really important. And in order to make sure that you have this rich diversity underground, you need a rich diversity of plants above ground because each type of plant with its type of nutrients and its type of root structure attracts different nutrients underground. So they're in this constant tango, this constant dance. And I'm showing you sort of a poster child for above ground diversity, which is a farm in Sonoma called Singing Frogs Farm. Maybe some of you have heard it, have heard of it. It's actually quite small. It's just a couple acres, but they're constantly keeping the ground covered and have, you know, dozens of different crops that they're growing at one time. And their soil has been studied by many soil scientists because of the amount of richness and, uh, you know, a diversity that they're producing below ground and the amount of carbon that they're able to store, uh, you know, for those of you who are interested in sort of the climate mitigating aspects of this. So this is another example of above, above ground diversity. At first glance, this might look just look like a cornfield, but if you look a lot more closely, what you see is a lot of different things going on here. And this is Piscinus Ranch, uh, that is also uh, down um, uh, near Hollister. And what they have is actually the three sisters growing in this field to, uh, together. They have beans and they have squash growing with their corn. They also have okra. And so they have a diversity of nutrients growing above ground. And uh, also their soil is another place that's being studied for its biodiversity below ground. A lot of people are interested now in whether this kind of both above ground diversity and soil microdiversity actually produces um, plants that have higher nutrient density. So that have more antioxidants and vitamins and minerals in them per unit ounce. And this is being pursued now as a, as a type of research. Uh, the data coming in are mixed, but there's really this positive signal or positive trend that when you grow things in this biodiverse way, either if you want to call this regenerative or agroecological way, that actually you are getting more um, antioxidants and uh, nutrients in the plants. So it is net positive for us in terms of the foods that we're eating. We certainly know that these forms of agriculture had other health benefits as well. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Amish and Hutterite studies, these studies which actually started in Europe looking at children on Bavarian farms have noted that children who are growing up on Amish farms where they're using very few pesticides and really using a lot of these regenerative techniques um, have um, much fewer rates of asthma, and allergy and other atopic um, health issues like eczema, for example. And uh, these studies were done when they com compared these children to children growing up on Hutterite farms who actually had higher rates of these problems. And, the ch and the, uh, both um, um, communities actually grow some of the same food, have a lot of the same customs and culture, are geographically often in the same areas, but the Hutterites actually uh, don't, they use a lot more herbicides and pesticides and have more conventional forms of agriculture 
agriculture. And uh, this appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine and was quite frankly, one of the first times where I saw a medical journal talk about soil as being protective and health giving. Usually, uh, the, you know, any mention of soil in a medical journal is really, they're talking about tetanus or something terrible. Uh, but here they're talking about how it was actually substances that was in house dust and soil that reprogrammed um, the immune systems of these kids. Um, and this is another, this is the actual study from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see that they're mentioning traditional farming practices that are what uh, protected these children. So uh, these are the original studies uh, that actually happened in Bavaria. And I spent some time with the researcher, Dr. Von Mutius, who's the one who started doing this, uh, this work. And these are the kind of photographs she loved to take in order to show folks what was going on in these farms where these kids were literally in the hay with the cows, you know, interacting with the soil. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, as an allopathic doctor, I'm not espousing that you start drinking raw milk. But in these studies, they did show that there was protective microbes in the raw milk as well. Raw milk is problematic enough that we're going to leave that off the table right now for discussion. But I feel like I need to mention it because it's in this photo. Um, and what they found in the studies in Bavaria was the same thing, was that there was an enormous diversity of microbes in these environments and that they seemed from a very early age to program these kids' immune systems and protect them. So this is a study that just came out last year that I find so interesting. This was uh, this took place somewhere in Illinois, and this was just looking at uh, gardeners, a leg, you know, who were not professional farmers at all. They were just uh, recreational gardeners, and looking at their microbiomes and looking at the microbiomes of their family and comparing them to non-gardeners. And this is a scientific report that came out in Nature. But uh, it is a tiny sample, so we can't hang our hat on this too much. But what it found was that at the beginning of the gardening season, uh, they actually looked at the gut microbiome of both the gardeners and the control uh, folks, the folks who weren't gardening. And they had about the same amount of biodiversity in their microbiome. And then they looked at the microbiome of both gardeners and the folks who had went nowhere near the garden at the end of the, or actually at the peak gardening season when they were in the, in the, in the, at the peak of harvest. And what they found was that the diversity score of the gardeners actually went way up and uh, the uh, folks who um, were not near the garden kind of stayed where they were at the beginning of the year. But there then was a significant difference between the gardeners and the non-gardeners. And they also looked and realized that the gardeners, what was making up the diversity in their gut was not just um, microbes that are normally found in humans, that they had actually become a host to microbes that exist both in the soil and that um, do well in the human gut. <laughs> and uh, so um, when they looked at the end of the season, the gardeners had a gut microbiome that looked a lot like the uh, microbiota that we've seen in pre-contact tribes like the Hadza in Tanzania and the Asaro in Papua New Guinea. And when they actually uh, dug in and looked at the types of microbes that they were seeing in there, they were actually seeing ones that were protective against things like inflammatory bowel disease and um, other um, uh, uh, gut health problems. So it actually looked like, you know, they were net positive, some beneficial microbes at the end of the season as a result of being proximal to soil. As I mentioned, this was a tiny study. It only involved a dozen or so families, uh, but is an interesting thing to contemplate. This is uh, um, another study that actually looked at Mycobacterium vaca, which is a bacteria that it just exists in soil and especially in you know, healthy soil, um, and uh, was actually realizing that it was um, improving mood and outlook in people who uh, were actually taking it as a supplement. 
Um, this study, they kind of backed into this finding because there was some old information that microbacterium vaca, mycobacterium vaca might actually help uh, with um, immune response and that they um, researchers had originally tried it uh, for people who had uh, advanced lung cancer, uh, thinking that somehow it would uh, be net benefit. Um, and they did it in a randomized trial. They realized that it actually had very little impact in terms of survival rates from the lung cancer. Uh, the people who took the mycobacterium vaca did not do any better than the controls in terms of their survival rate. But as an incidental finding, they um, realized that the uh, people who were taking the vodka were reporting much po more positive outlook <laughs> relative to the folks who weren't and were um, their mood scores and depression scores uh, were, uh, um, were much improved. And uh, so then they started to actually administer it in other studies and see how it impacted uh, mood and found that it had a very positive response there. How does it do that? Um, hard to know exactly. Um, some folks think it might be through stimulating uh, the vagal nerve, some through parasympathetic or sympathetic tone, uh, you know, from the gut to the brain. There's lots of different theories on how this is happening and this is a rich area of study right now. So um, the, at the end of the day, what I often say when I see farmers doing this in their fields, uh, like Cody Holmes is doing here, I say that they're actually getting psychotherapy. So finally, the last part of diversity that I really need to emphasize is farmer diversity. And this is something that oftentimes when people are talking about biodiversity on farms, they don't focus on as much. But we know that when there's a diversity of people who own the land and who are able to grow food on that land, that we actually get much more sustainable forms of farming and more sustainable communities because actually those dollars are going back to that community and keeping healthy food in that community and so on. So as we talk about diversity, we can't just talk about it in the soil or in what's growing in the soil, but who owns that soil and who is farming on that soil. So boosting diversity is number one. Number two is minimizing disturbance. Now, this is another large almond farm that is in the Central Valley. But this farm is a very different kind of farm. It's owned by the Burroughs family. And if you look at this farm, you immediately notice it's very different because it has a lot of stuff growing under the trees. And actually it's got animals in between the trees. And as we talked about, when you have things growing under the trees, they're there to suck the water away in the rainy, rainy season and keep the moisture there in, in the dry season. They're also there to attract pollinators, uh, and they're also there to feed animals that can graze underneath and then put their fertility, their excrement down under the trees and grow the trees. Um, so the burrows were faced with a bit of a dilemma because as I mentioned, the way you harvest uh, these almonds is that uh, you shake the trees and they fall on the ground. And so if you have this bare ground, it's a lot easier to collect those almonds and it's not problematic, right? So they decided, they came up with something very ingenious, which was, hey, let's lay tarps down and harvest onto the tarps. And then we just don't have to worry about this. And so that's what they did. And um, they circumvented uh, the need for bare ground. Um, and if you're interested, you really should visit their farm because pretty much everything they do on their farm is in with the with the intent of uh, you know boosting diversity and minimizing and um, minimizing disturbance and conserving resources. And this is another farm near Hollister that is actually a vegetable farm. You can see they have their crop of onions uh, going in there. 
But unlike a lot of other farms, this farm decided uh, this farmer decided that he loved weeds for the same reason that they're there to you know uh, attract different kinds of pollinators, that they serve as these kind of riparian ways for animals, that they once again they're there to you know hold in moisture when needed or draw moisture away when it's not needed, and that they didn't want to you know strip the ground bare of their weeds. And what is so interesting is if you look at these weeds, you realize that a lot of them are actually delicious. Most of what's growing in this picture is mallow, uh, which has is an absolutely wonderful green. It's tender. You can pick it in salads. It grows all over San Francisco and the East Bay. Uh, you know, Probably if you walked outside right now, you'd find a lot of mallow growing right on your sidewalk. And we, it's uh, drought tolerant and pest resistant. It's, um, you know, as you know, these things grow in very high yield. It's nitrogen fixing. Uh, so it actually pulls nitrogen back into the soil, uh, chock full of nutrients and incredibly tasty. Um, I did a study with some colleagues where we actually looked at some of the nutrient content of these, uh, these wild uh, foods, and we found that it had, you know, twice as much potassium as spinach, and, you know, nine, it, you know, way more fiber, five times as much fiber, and actually higher in protein. I mean, so like, really incredibly uh, beneficial. And I love to share this picture because, uh, this is a farmer who uh, was uh, growing uh, stuff in a hoop house in, uh, in New Hampshire. And he invited me to his farm to see all these fabulous things that he was growing in his hoop house. And this was in March. And I went and visited him and I walked into the hoop house. And um, as I was walking in, he said to me, oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. Don't look at all that chickweed that's growing here at the entrance to my hoop house. I meant to pull it out before you came so that I could have a clean greenhouse for you. And I kind of took note of that. But then two days later, I was in New York City at the Union Square Farmer's Market. And all of a sudden, I saw one farmer uh, who was selling chickweed at the Union Square Farmer's Market. And I, I don't know if you can see here, but he was selling it for $24 a pound. So, you know, here is this farmer who's, you know, so excited about these uh, fruits and vegetables that he's getting for maybe, you know, two or $3 a pound when he actually had a gold mine sitting right in front. And those kinds of things are, you know, kind of shifting how we're thinking about waste and um, weeds and so on. Um, this is uh, a, a farmer in Wisconsin uh, um, who is actually growing things in a way that is truly minimizing disturbance and that he has a permaculture farm that's at scale and everything that he is growing has roots in the ground 365 days a year. And he harvests from bushes and trees and doesn't disturb the soil at all and is able to um, have um, uh, an enormous amount of, bio of diversity. So finally, our last idea, we've talked about uh, boosting diversity, minimizing disturbance, and conserving resources is the last one. And uh, this is another farm in August in the Central Valley. And while all the neighbors' uh, farms were bare soil, <laughs> at this point, because um, they had just harvested their summer crops. What they put in on this farm was a cover crop of daikon, which is great because, you know, we all love daikon and we can make salads from it, but it's also having this uh, role of protecting the soil and uh, conserving our most important resource here in California, which is water. And what I'm gonna show you right now is what that soil looked like in August when he pulled out that daikon. You can see how incredibly wet it is. And this is on an acreage where they barely, barely water in the heat of summer in the Central Valley because they have these cover crops here. 
So they actually act as almost like a, a layer of, uh, of, of, you know, a protective layer on the earth, holding in the soil and keeping it from flying away. Um, these are farmers in the Great Plains that I actually wrote about uh, for an article also at the height of COVID. Uh, I wrote about it for Civil Eats. And what they decided to do was they wanted to address the problem of soil loss and food insecurity. So they started growing cover crops of squash and okra and beans and so on to protect their soil and keep that healthy. But then they actually would let communities and food banks come on and harvest directly from the land. And I thought this was such a beautiful idea because one of the greatest um, types of food that we waste in this country is fruits and vegetables. About 48% of them, as you can see, go to waste. The only thing we waste more than fruits and vegetables is seafood, unfortunately, which is just disastrous because that's such a precious uh, type of food. But you know how beautiful that you keep the fruits and vegetables on the soil where it was grown, let people come and pick what they want and whatever else is left just goes back to feed that soil. So um, I, you know, that's a win-win solution as far as I'm concerned. Um, and this is a conventional dairy farmer also in the Central Valley, but who's doing something that I thought was really interesting when it comes to conserving resources. His farm is right near all those, you know, that million and a half acres of, of almond production. And so he actually has gone and uh, taken the almond hull hulls and uh, discovered that they're actually perfect nutrition for dairy cows. It is very easily digested and augments milk production and is actually much more sustainable than a lot of other stuff. And so he's been recycling the almond hulls and actually using those to feed his cows. So another interesting way of conserving resources. So there you have it, boosting diversity, minimizing disturbance and conserving resources as these three pathways to health. Now in closing, I wanna just quickly ground this for you in my work and how this plays out day to day uh, for my health and the health of uh, my community and my patients. So as I mentioned, I work in a Richmond, which is here in the Bay Area. And um, Richmond is a, a community which uh, in, has uh, things that are, you know, sort of rich, taking up on that word, has some of the richest resources and all, and at the same time, um, it has, is also so unresourced in other ways. Here is our clinic. Uh, and um, um, Richmond sort of sits, in the shadow of the 2,300 acre Chevron oil refinery. Um, it had some of the highest rates of COVID deaths. It is, has got some of the highest rates of unemployment, of heart disease, of diabetes. Um, and so, you know, lots of health challenges, but it's also one of the first communities in the United States to have a health in all policies ordinance. And it has a rich network of community-based organizations and community members who are very, very active. Um, and it's a majority uh, Latinx and African-American community and um, uh, with rich uh, network of everything from uh, youth groups to art groups to churches and so on. And so uh, lots of important social activities and cultural activities going on. And this is one of the gems of Richmond. It is Urban Tilth, which is a two acre farm, which far, it is a regenerative or agroecological farm. You can see it looks a lot like that other farm I showed you, Singing Frogs Farm, where each uh, row is growing different type of fruit or vegetable. And it sits on Brookside Avenue. Um, and on top of this farm, Urban Tilth, which is a nonprofit and is community owned, also has um, uh, lots of other small farms going on around Richmond, including in the elementary schools, uh, in the Richmond Greenway, uh, different uh, um, uh, pocket parks, and even on sidewalks, there's, there, there's uh, trees planting and, and food going on. And our clinic, William Jenkins Health Center and Urban Tilth have a memorandum of understanding to work together to promote health. 
And we really think of it as creating this circle of health in our community that really goes in, you know, uh, at a radius of these two and a half acres. And we do this in a whole variety of ways. For example, Urban Tilth uh, has a CSA that includes not only the stuff that they're growing on their farm, but also fruits and vegetables from farmers in the North Bay who mostly are farmers of color, who contract with Urban Tilth and send their fruits and vegetables each week to be a part of their community supported agriculture. It goes into these bags and uh, the community either purchases it at full price or at a sliding scale or actually gets it free through different grant programs. In our clinic, we are receiving Medi-Cal dollars through community supports or CalAIM to actually pay for this food. So we're able to prescribe the food and Urban Tilth is a vendor and we can reimburse them for each one of these bags that goes to our patients. And so already we're starting this cycle of health. And then we have these healthy eating group visits where you can come in and get your blood pressure checked and get medications refilled. But then we work together as a group and we cook together and we go through those bags of vegetables that come in each week from Urban Tilth. And we talk about all the vegetables and how we can prepare them. And then folks take those home as their prescription. So it's not just the dollars going around, it's the food going around as well. And then um, a lot of the scraps actually end up going back to the farm. Another way that we're involved is that we actually have uh, a lot of partnerships. We show up together uh, for everything from Halloween festivals to Earth Day festivals to you know, um, uh, MLK Day festivals and so on, and uh, do work together in the community. And we now are the recipients through uh, the Strategic Growth Council of a $36 million grant called Richmond Rising, which is there to grow health equity and climate resilience by doing all this work together. And um, a part of the grant is not just the, the veggie RX and the, and the growing the food and distributing the food. It also involves um, uh, creating um, uh, trails and healthy uh, um, walking ways, um, complete streets, a um, access garden for folks in wheelchairs or with access needs, greening. It's a, we're creating a health um, coach certificate, so contributing to jobs and pathways to careers in health, um, and bringing dollars, what we call, this is kind of a model of a, what's called a circular food economy, or bringing dollars into the community and keeping them there and cycling them there through the food and the jobs and so on. So this is actually what I think of when I think of the connection between soil and health for you and for the folks in Richmond and for all of us. And uh, here's an example of all the um, people who work for Urban Tilth. Uh, these are, I teach in a family medicine residency program that's based in Richmond and our young doctors in training each spend a month on the farm, rotating through the farm and actually learning how food is grown and distributed and the policies that underlie that and how food moves around through a community. And we also, these same young doctors go into the schools and work with the children in the gardens and cook with them because that's also a, a piece of, of building health. So, and here's a, one of our residents actually doing um, a program for uh, trainees at Urban Tilth and actually giving them health coaching skills. So a lot of it is actually career building as well. So in closing, when I think of soil and I think of our health, I really do think of them as not just these parallel structures, but actually that they're completely interconnected. Um, but still, it's kind of great to see how parallel we are. So if you, if you look at a cross-section of soil and you look at a cross-section of our skin, for example, um, all the layers kind of are the same, the structures of you know, how the nutrients flow, the things that grow on top, whether it be hair or, uh, you know, uh, plants, 
Um, and even, you know, the, the way that our, our, our arteries work um, is very much the way that the mycorrhizal fungi um, kind of operate in the soil. And so these very similar structures, um, the same way if you look at a cross-section of soil or a cross-section of the intestine. And uh, this is one of these is the rootlets of plants. And one of them is the vasculature of our kidneys. And you can see how, you know, just on every level, we really are rooted in soil. And at the end of the day, I really like to tell folks, uh, and this is on a microscopic level. If you look at it, it's the villi in our intestine that's interacting with microbes. And the other one is the rootlets of plants interacting with microbes. And you can see even on electron microscope, they're the same. And what I really like to tell folks at the end of the day is that we are, in fact, soil. Yes, thank you so much. That was just a, an amazing talk. I'll start with one of the first questions that's posted. I have my own <laughs> list of questions as well. But one of the participants asks, how can we learn more about the benefits of healthy soil? Okay, well, that's a great, easy start. I actually think that there's nothing better than doing. <laughs> So whether it's in a community garden or joining one of the leagues of urban gardeners, if you're in the city, or um, uh, volunteering at Urban Tilt, <laughs> we're always looking for volunteers, um, uh, you know, actually doing is really where you understand. Um, I, I have to say that I did this work for a lot of years, um, and it was really when I started to take my own gardening very, very seriously and try and apply those principles that they started to really make sense. So that's my simple answer. Um, you know, in terms of... Um, uh, you know, going to there's there's a lot of terrific literature now on you know soil health and and agroecology um, and uh, I, I'm happy to you know uh, I, I I could I could go you know through a, through a list of stuff maybe starting with Gabe Brown's book on soil but might be a good place to go. So. Great, and also I think as I mentioned the books that you written, the two books you've written, I think touch on a lot of different parts of your talk that you gave today, but also a lot of really accessible information about healthy soil and how it relates to health as well. So they do, but I do in no means put myself forward as the expert. <laughs> I am a doctor by day, but yeah. <laughs> so one of the next questions is, oh, I love this. Do humans encounter the same benefits from cohabitating with domestic animals versus farm animals for their gut microbiome? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, for a while, you know, the research was kind of iffy. At this point, I think it's pretty clear that, yeah, you can get, you know, dog owners, <laughs> cat owners, particularly dog owners, you know, and of course, there's always that concern of the downside of pets. You know, some people will mention that in terms of um, you know, diseases that can be spread, but it seems to be net positive in every way, both emotionally and in terms of microbial diversity. Um, one of the next questions is... Yeah, I, I should also add that in family, so in family networks, there is also that benefit. They've shown that families that share spoons together more and okay. things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, the, this participant is just um, talking about that you brought up several farms in your presentation, um, you know, and one of the farms is 7,000 acres and the Burroughs family farms is um, 1,100 acres. What do you think of the feasibility of regenerative agriculture when thinking about these much larger farms with hundreds of thousands of acres? Well, hundreds of thousands of acres, I think, is problematic for the reason I mentioned. It's just really hard not to consolidate, right, and just plant a couple of things. It's just those types of farms, in order to do that kind of diversity at scale, is very, very challenging. I really think the sweet spot is where we were, um, you know, prior to the consolidation, which, you know, it, it, I think that small farms absolutely have their role but realistically in terms of sort of feeding this country are the farms that were under 2000 acres and that kind of diversity really is possible on that you know uh, type of farm not just in what you're planting as your cash crop but also with those cover cropping mm -hmm. the, the intercropping mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. 
The next question this that one of the participants posed was actually something I had kind of was just wondering about as well. So I might just read what the participant wrote and then tag on to it a little bit, but talking about um, just really appreciating this, um, you know, the theme of how we are all connected by our soil, what government changes are being done to build more diverse farming, especially in the Central Valley. And I was thinking about this kind of topic when we were looking at the chart of the obesity changes and thinking about the food bill and how so much is federal policy and that legislation that was put into place that really kind of drove those crops being put into production and was curious, you know, so in line with this question about more diverse farming, but also if you were aware of or can talk a little bit about the efforts being done at the federal level about what's being funded to, in terms of like work with farmers are growing what they're being paid to grow. So how, what is being done to change that? Yeah, well, first of all, I love that you called it the food bill because I wish it were a food bill. <laughs> the farm bill, and that's yeah. actually um, part of the problem here in this yeah. country, is that we don't necessarily connect farming to food. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of what we grow is actually not even to be fed to humans. You know, it's either to be fed to animals and, you know, uh, as a result, you know, then I guess, you know, we eat the animals or it's to, you know, um, grow biofuel and be fed to cars. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and much of what we grow in terms of those three crops, the corn, soy, and wheat, it doesn't even stay in the U.S. It's shipped overseas. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we really do have to just be more connected in that way. What are the efforts uh, that are happening? They are happening. I mean, there's, uh, you know, a lot of the incentives that were there in terms of insurance uh, payments and so on are at least starting to uh, uh, be pulled back a little bit. And there is more support for uh, smaller and mid-sized farms and that sort of diversity of farming. Um, there's actually uh, funding in the farm bill to, to see how to get um, more uh, uh, produce <laughs> um, uh, um, out to um, folks, you know, through SNAP dollars mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, food assistance dollars and, and WIC uh, dollars, and which is, you know, we have 41 million folks in the US who receive some form of federal food assistance. So, you know, the fact that that, and most of that funding comes from the Farm Bill, the mm -hmm. fact that they're actually starting to tie that to local farmers and, you know, getting veggies, you know, local veggies, you know, through staff dollars is, is all very hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, I really encourage people to read up on the Farm Bill. It's being ratified into law again this September. Um, and, you know, to really pay attention to the different pieces of it and um, to, uh, you know, especially the parts that are the federal nutrition assistance parts, you know, to, to uh, you know, anything that will put more dollars into the hands of local farms and community farms and regional farms and farmers of color and all of that is going to actually promote more healthy eating um, an interesting thing that is coming down the pike is um, this food is medicine movement. And I mentioned that here in California, we now have Medi-Cal waivers so that we can prescribe food, at least to some patients, including bags of vegetables, and have that reimbursed. And so we have Urban Tilth as one of our vendors in Contra Costa County. And I'm literally able to prescribe from my office and a patient will get a bag of veggies from Urban Tilth and they will receive money from our local health plan. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing this in California as the kind of kooky California waiver. There's a couple of other states that have done it like New York and uh, so kooky New York, I guess, and kooky Massachusetts. But um, the hope is that eventually this will be Medi-Cal or you know, Medicaid, Medicare um, uh, nationwide, that there will be that ability to pay for local fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. But what we really want is that those dollars stay local and don't go you know, to some big company in the middle of the country that's shipping food you know, to, to, the, to these folks, you know, sort of pharmaceuticalizing it. We really yeah. want to keep those dollars yeah. local. Thank you.